the gut is the first line of defense. If you're eating the wrong way, the gut is going to be the first to experience the impact of that. And that can be anything from foods that are physically irritating, mechanically irritating to the gut, things like grains and, and legumes and certain types of seeds, all the way to foods that are very difficult to digest. And so a lot of my patients who have mental health symptoms, many of them will also have uh, poor gut health. Well, good morning, Dr. Georgia Eid. Dr. Eid is a Harvard-trained, board-certified psychiatrist specializing in nutritional and metabolic psychiatry. Her passion is really empowering people with psychiatric conditions to reduce, or in some cases, uh, in the transition, to transition them off psychiatric medication, to de-prescribe them. And she's, she's uh, a bit controversial on different topics, but uh, what she's, the information that she's putting out is very well supported uh, on views like fiber, animal-based diets, data that's recently emerging. And we're going to cover some of that. And, uh, and actually, this topic is covered very nicely in her new book that's coming out, Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind, A Food First Plan to Optimize Your Mental Health. Uh, welcome, Dr. Georgia E. Thank you for being here today. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So before we begin, I think it's really important for our listeners to, many of them may not uh, understand or know your background. And uh, I was familiar with your website. I think I came across your website maybe 2013. I don't remember exactly when you started, but it must have been 2013 because I saw you, the first time I saw you speak in public, I was really captivated by what you were saying because it was unlike anything anybody was talking about, especially uh, a Harvard <laughs> trained psychiatrist. And I think that was at the ancestral health symposium. I believe it was, it was a while back and it was at least 10 years ago, but you were on this topic. It seems like you were on the topic of metabolic psychiatry, maybe almost before anyone else, or you were put on my radar at least before anyone else. And you were out there, you took the initiative to get out there and speak about it. So maybe give our listeners a little background uh, about what you do. And also metabolic psychiatry is pretty new topic and maybe describe a little bit about what that is. Absolutely. Uh, I remember meeting you at the Ancestral Health Symposium. It was uh, 2012. It was the first time I'd really spoken about, uh, as you said, uh, these topics um, uh, in public in any kind of, um, uh, in a professional form. And so that particular, at that time, I was practicing psychiatry at the Harvard University Health Service and uh, was, was already beginning to incorporate some nutrition principles into my work there. I, of course, had been hired, as most psychiatrists are hired uh, in clinic and institutional settings. I'd been hired to prescribe medication primarily, and, uh, but, I, but I was also incorporating some nutrition principles into my work. And at that time, I was very interested in food, uh, uh, sort of the, the nutritional differences between plant and animal foods some of the natural chemicals that exist in, in foods that I found surprising and fascinating. I was really diving into nutrition science. I know you have a background in nutrition science as well, um, Dom. And so that was my focus at the time. And it was really that presentation, uh, which uh, was called Little Shop of Horrors, uh, you know, the risks and benefits of eating, of eating vegetables. Uh, and that was really a topic that I was really interested in and found just so surprising, so interesting. And But then over time, my, my interest broadened to not just food science, nutrition science, uh, but also to, to brain metabolism and how, how we can use the science of brain food to feed the brain better. And so as a psychiatrist, I became really interested in how I could use not just nutritional strategies, but metabolic strategies to improve the mental health, metabolic health, and overall health of my patients. And so that my work has evolved over time to include not just nutritional principles, but also metabolic principles. And so now the cornerstone of my work really uh, has become, in the past five to 10 years, the ketogenic diet, and which, as, as you know very well, is a really powerful uh, metabolic intervention that um, that I, I wish more people knew about, which is one of the reasons why I wrote the book. So yeah, and, and I remember, I do remember uh, meeting there and I've been speaking about a lot of different topics since then. 
Uh, but that conference gave me gave me the first the first audience to sort of air these ideas, these controversial ideas. Well, fast forwarding more than a decade later, after you've put out so much information, you've helped so many people, you've really been uh, a gift, I think, uh, to this whole movement of metabolic psychiatry as someone who's credentialed, someone who's knowledgeable, someone who has a personal story <laughs> to add to it, much like uh, Dr. Ian Campbell, too. Uh, so I, you spoke recently and uh, you were in Switzerland recently at the uh, Keto Live conference, which we attended to, and you talked about your upcoming book. And in addition to that, I think you've been traveling nonstop, it seems, but you, you were also at the International Society for Bipolar Disorder. I believe that was in Chicago. I didn't have the opportunity to go there, but maybe share uh, with your listeners, uh, with our listeners here, uh, you know, a summary of those stories. We'll get into the research projects that you're doing, uh, but sort of how many events have evolved in upper level conferences have evolved that actually become a platform to talk about metabolic psychiatry. So this is, I mean, that was kind of unprecedented at a conventional uh, you know, I, I present sometimes at American Epilepsy Society and the ketogenic diet is largely marginalized. And so I'm wondering kind of what feedback you got from Keto Live, which is a little bit of a different uh, uh, attendance there to the International Society for Bipolar Disorder and maybe your experiences there. Yeah. So it, it does seem that we run into each other at various places around the world. It's it's such an honor and a privilege to be invited to speak in, in, in these places. And I did just come back from a very long uh, uh, series of conferences, two in the United Kingdom, one in the Netherlands, and uh, then Keto Live in Switzerland, and then uh, uh, ISBD in Chicago, and then a conference here in Western Massachusetts. Some of these conferences are really focused on ketogenic diets, such as Keto Live. And so there in a certain way, I'm speaking to people who already understand and believe in the power of these uh, of the ketogenic diet for mental health and for other conditions. But some of these conferences, this is what this is what's new, is that some of these conferences are general nutrition conferences or general health conferences where this has become a topic of interest. People, and this this is not something I'd experienced before. And so, in in some of these cases, I had the opportunity to speak to audiences who knew very little. Uh, if anything, about ketogenic diets. And that's really exciting because this is information that's new to them uh, and that uh, gives people hope. There's a lot of people who are listening, uh, clinicians and general public alike, feel as though they've already tried everything or they've tried the conventional wisdom about nutrition, they've tried medications, they've tried therapy, and nothing else has really been working in a lot of cases. And so this really does give people something new, uh, new strategies to consider, new strategies to implement that at least in, in my experience and experience of my handful of colleagues who do this uh, for a living, it's really exciting and really uh, effective in, in most cases. It must be. I know it's exciting, especially when you're showcasing new data that you have on disorders that are otherwise intractable or, you know, resistant to pharmacotherapy. Uh, I know, you know, as I speak, when I lecture to the medical students, in our nutrition uh, concentration program, which is now going to be a required course uh, for our medical college. Uh, <laughs> it's taken a while to do that, but it'll be a required course that students will have to take. But when I lecture about ketogenic diets and the students are kind of like a deer in headlight, but it's like they're captivated because it's like they've never heard this information before. And, uh, and we'll get to the research that you showcased and, and talked about uh, at the conference, but um, so it's just, yeah, it's so exciting to present a new idea, a fresh, what, it, what is a fresh idea to people, um, you know, at a, at a new event. And so before we get into kind of the, the research that you're doing, which I'm super excited to talk about and also working with uh, the Bazuki Foundation uh, for brain health too, we'll get into more about that, but let's dive into kind of your work kind of personally and how you personally integrate uh, metabolic psychiatry or ketogenic diets into your practice? And for example, like, do you have, what's your ratio of males to females? And do you treat everyone the same way? I can imagine there's uh, quite a bit of art and science uh, and nuance associated with, with working with the patients. And like, how do you go about, uh, and this is a question uh, my sister had too, because she's a, a psychiatrist who's trained at Hopkins and, and she treats people 
uh, and she's warming up to the idea of using nutritional uh, therapy because uh, she has patients who definitely will respond. But her whole thing is how do you transition them from a drug-based therapy to a diet therapy and adjust? So I know a lot of questions there, males versus females, and how do you personalize this approach in your practice? Sure. So uh, yeah, lots of good questions there. So I've never counted males versus females, but I, I think they're probably fairly well balanced. Uh, I'm a general uh, adult psychiatrist. I don't see children uh, or, or young teens, uh, but I see adults of all ages and I treat all psychiatric conditions. And so um, I, everything from relatively straightforward uh, cases of ADHD and minor depression and uh, anxiety, panic attacks, uh, to more complicated conditions, uh, things like PTSD, bipolar disorder, uh, schizophrenia, and, uh, and even early dementia. And so really anything that people come in with, I, uh, I will work with them uh, to use nutrition uh, uh, strategies to, to try to improve how they feel. And so I think I'm really excited to hear that your sister is a psychiatrist, and I'm happy to talk with her anytime. Really what my goal is with people is to optimize their brain health using nutritional strategies, whichever strategies they are willing and able to try. And these can include very simple strategies. Most people who are coming to me are coming to me taking uh, at least one psychiatric medication, often more than one psychiatric medication, as is often the case in psychiatry. Unfortunately, most people are taking multiple medications. So most people are taking medication, but there are also some people who come because they don't want to start medication. They're trying to avoid even starting a psychiatric medication. And that's a really ideal situation because once the medications are there, it does become a little bit more complicated sometimes to, to, uh, uh, to adopt the diet, transition to the diet. And then, of course, the, it can be a, a rather long process to carefully reduce the psychiatric medications after the person has, has adjusted the diet. So, and so in any case, I use a lot of different, quite, as you said, it's more of an art than a science, uh, a lot of personalized strategies. So everything from simply cleaning up the diet by removing as much of the ultra processed foods and sort of modern industrialized foods as we possibly can, the sugars, the flours, the vegetable oils, and all of the, the snack foods. And then uh, I really love starting with a foundational diet. I think for human health uh, is sort of a paleo style diet, which means removing the grains and the legumes and the flours and the sugars and the modern processed foods. And even if people are willing the dairy products, which we don't have to talk about today, that's a more complicated topic. But really just to go back to a whole foods principles, uh, a whole plant and animal foods, uh, pre-agricultural whole plant and animal foods before the advent of agriculture. So that alone can often bring people tremendous benefit because it's so much healthier than what most people are eating. But then in many, many cases, because so many of us, depending which study you read, it could be 52% or as high as 88% of us have poor metabolic health. Um, usually that unfortunately no longer will be enough to, uh, to, to really get people feeling the way that the, uh, be their best. And in those cases, which is many, many cases, we often need to address uh, carbohydrate intake and, uh, and in many cases, uh, transition to a ketogenic diet. Because if you've been eating the wrong way for a long time and your metabolism is, is damaged, which is the case for most of us, the brain will not be able to use glucose. Uh, you won't be able to metabolize carbohydrate properly and, you, and your brain won't be able to utilize glucose efficiently or effectively the way that it should. And in those cases, a ketogenic diet will really be the, uh, uh, the strategy that you need to go to in order to re-energize your brain. If you've heard me talk on other podcasts before, you know that I believe that tracking your glucose and optimizing your metabolic health is really the ultimate life hack. We know that cravings and mood instability and energy levels and weight are all tied to our blood sugar levels. And of course, all the downstream chronic diseases that are related to blood sugar are things that we can really greatly improve our chances of avoiding if we keep our blood sugar in a healthy and stable level throughout our lifetime. So 
I've been using CGM now on and off for the past four years since we started Levels, and I have learned so much about my diet and my health. I've learned the simple swaps that keep my blood sugar stable, like flax crackers instead of wheat-based crackers. I've learned which fruits work best for my blood sugar. Like I do really well with pears and apples and oranges and berries, but grapes seem to spike my blood sugar off the chart. I'm also a notorious night owl, and I've really learned with using Levels how if I get to bed at a reasonable hour and get good quality sleep, my blood sugar levels are so much better. And that has been so motivating for me on my health journey. It's also been helpful for me um, in terms of keeping my weight at a stable level uh, much more effortlessly than it has been in the past. So you can sign up for levels at levels.link slash health, get access to a continuous glucose monitor and the level software that helps you really uh, dial into a lot of these strategies for your life and your body. How has the field of metabolic psychiatry evolved and what are the principles behind it? And, um, you know, I'm, I'm often interested in also, maybe we'll get to a little bit later, but I'm very interested in amazing people and who their mentors were. <laughs> and in addition to like who your mentors were, but how, what directed you down this path? And you've kind of carved out a niche for yourself and kind of created your own path, really, and probably took a lot of information from from different types of people and integrated it into into your practice. And I think it, it kind of goes into the next question I want to ask is like, how has the, the field of metabolic psychiatry evolved and and kind of and you did answer this in some uh, what are the key concepts involved? And it sounds like you're really dialed in on insulin resistance and, and also glycemic control. And we know, I know personally, I'm wearing a, a, a CGM device, you know, using the Levels Health app. And I know I could almost predict how I feel kind of not actually looking at my CGM trace, but how I feel I can look at my CGM trace and tell you what it's saying, <laughs> you know, if, if I'm low or high or variability. So there's emerging technology and, you know, the hardware is very interesting and that's emerging too, but the apps uh, integrate the information and can give actionable information. So that's from the glucose management side, but also the insulin, uh, the insulin resistance side, which is like the underlying problem, right? I mean, in our nutrition class, we talk a lot about, you know, what is insulin resistance? What leads to type two diabetes? You know, Dr. Barbara Hansen, he's, she's worked with Gerald Schulman and all the top people and wrote a book really on metabolic health and insulin resistance. So we really go down the insulin path although we don't really approach the metabolic psychiatry and how it's integrated into that. So maybe you could talk to our, our listeners here about the evolution of metabolic psychiatry and how that is integrating, you know, measuring insulin, what biomarkers do you look at and glycemic variability and glycemic control? How important is that? Yes. So another dozen questions to address. And so I, I, uh, that's okay. I, I, um, I'm a morning person, so I, I'll, I'll begin. The, so I think the evolution of me- <laughs> the evolution of metabolic psychiatry, and you know how I became interested in it, is was really about uh, my own personal story of you know improving my own physical health through dietary experimentation, uh, which is something I really, I really encourage my patients to adopt a mindset of curiosity and experimentation and discovery, rather than saying this is telling everybody this is what I think you need to do. Uh, I say, well, let's find out what you need to do and let's find out, you know, what diet is going to work best for you. And that, that is really where CGMs come in, but I'll come back to that. But the evolution of metabolic psychiatry and the reason I became interested is because I was trying to understand why this sort of unorthodox diet that I had stumbled into experimentally, um, which was a, was a, uh, higher fat, lower fiber, relatively low plant, a uh, high cholesterol, high animal food diet, why was that diet the diet that reversed all of the health problems that I'd encountered in my early 40s and that so many of my patients had been struggling with and I had, I, and I had no idea how to help them with those issues. So I, I thought, well, this diet must be good for the brain, but that, that was surprising to me. I didn't, I didn't adopt this diet. I didn't go down the dietary path to try to improve my brain health. I was trying to improve my physical health. But I noticed that my mood was better, my energy was better, my concentration was better, my stamina, my mental stamina was better, my sleep was better. I, I was much less easily ruffled by you know the stresses of daily living, and that was a really 
profound experience for me as a psychiatrist. And I thought, well, what is going on here? And so I, I studied nutrition for the very first time. I'd never studied nutrition before. Psychiatrists are not taught about nutrition. <laughs> You're, thank you. Thank you for getting a class required for, for students. This is, this is key. We need to teach the future clinicians about the, the science of nutrition. It's very, very important. In any case, like most women, I thought of food as simply a way to control my weight. I never thought about it how it might affect brain health. We didn't talk about nutrition in four years of psychiatry residency training. We didn't talk about food once, not even when we were talking about eating disorders. And so it was really remarkable, that blind spot. So uh, what I did was I just kind of dove into the science, all the primary literature, the, the scientific articles, and started reading widely uh, across a variety of disciplines, uh, botany, anthropology, uh, psychiatry, toxicology, animal husbandry, everything I could get in my hands to try to put together the, this information that I, I didn't understand. I needed to, un I wanted to really get to the bottom of it. Psychiatrists love getting to the bottom of things. So I wanted to get to the bottom of this. And so um, what that, what, what that led me to was some, I, you know, I came across, for example, a paper in 1965 that had been uh, published about 10 women who had been uh, with schizophrenia, who were, had been in the hospital setting uh, placed on a ketogenic diet for a brief period of time. And while the report is, you know, it's not very detailed, um, the clinicians there did notice that their schizophrenia symptoms improved. And I came across uh, information in the literature about how bipolar and epilepsy, bipolar disorder and epilepsy are so similar. We use the same, many of the same medications are used to stabilize seizure uh, activity. Those very same medicines are in many cases used to stabilize mood in people with bipolar disorder. And so there, it turns out that there are actually many, many similarities between bipolar disorder and epilepsy. And I thought, well, we've known for, well, now over a hundred years now that, uh, that ketogenic diets stabilize, uh, have the ability to essentially stop seizures in their tracks for many, many people. Uh, and that's powerful uh, evidence that that this is a brain stabilizing diet. This diet that stabilizes brain chemistry. And if that's the case, shouldn't it also be the case? So could it potentially also be the case that would stabilize brain chemistry for people with mood swings? And that made this just made intuitive sense to me. And there had already been some papers written about that, sort of postulating, it's a hypothesizing about that. And that's when I became interested. And that was, you know, uh, maybe ten years ago or so. That's when I became interested in the potential of the ketogenic diet to, to improve uh, the, the brain health uh, and the mood and, and so forth of, of my patients. And the more experience you get, the more, uh, the more you see the power of, of these diets. I mean, when you use these in clinical practice, there's nothing else that works as well as the ketogenic diet. And not just better in most cases than medications alone or even than medications at all, but but uh, with many, many fewer side effects, whatever side effects you're going to see are usually very temporary, short-lived, just a few weeks often, and tremendous number of what I like to call side benefits. So you're not, instead of the psychiatric medications, which often really damage metabolic health, particularly the antipsychotic medications, you're seeing the opposite. You're seeing metabolic health and overall physical health improve. So it's a pretty compelling weight practice. I have a question about, oh, I have so many questions now. So uh, the first question is, uh, you know, a side effect of the ketogenic diet for epilepsy in kids is, and adults, is weight loss. So they, they actually view that as a side effect in kids, you know, if they're not gaining enough weight. Uh, in, in this case, reducing BMI, reducing body fat mass and changing, having favorable body composition alterations is typically associated with improved markers of cardiometabolic health, including inflammatory cytokines and things like that. So do you think that, uh, and this gets talked about a lot when it comes to diet debates, high carb versus low carb, when you lose weight and create a caloric restriction, then all the benefits kind of, many benefits come with it. So in the context of metabolic psychiatry, you know, when it comes to designing a, a clinical trial and, and, and actually disentangling the, the benefits of nutritional ketosis versus, you know, being in a state of ketosis versus weight loss in your patients, do you see 
benefits, uh, psychiatric benefits, improvements independent of weight loss, or do they parallel uh, the changes in weight loss? I, mean, I guess you probably have patients that are under, maybe not necessarily they have to lose weight too. So what are your thoughts there? And yeah, there is, you know, I teach uh, neuropharmacology and I teach schizophrenia and all the psychiatric drugs to typicals and the atypicals and the atypicals in particular, antipsychotics cause metabolic dysregulation that is highly disadvantageous, I guess you could say. So you touched on that a little bit. Uh, so yeah, getting people off those drugs is a big thing. But when it comes to weight loss, do you think this diet is working? I mean, it's, there's many ways that it's working, but do you think that's a major factor? I think this is a fantastic question. And I think it, it will be difficult to tease this apart in, in, in studies, but the ketogenic diet does not, is not necessarily a weight loss diet. You can formulate the diet, especially dietitians are very good at this. Uh, um, you can formulate the diet to be weight neutral, constructing the diet so that the majority of the ketones that are being produced uh, inside your body are coming from food as opposed to from your body fat. So you can do that. And I have had some normal weight patients and even some slightly underweight patients and some very physically fit patients, you know, very athletic patients uh, who did not need to lose any weight, uh, adopt this diet and experience remarkable uh, improvements in their, in their mental health. And that had nothing to do with weight loss, obviously. So I, at least in my experience, I see the weight loss as a benefit, but not necessarily the goal. And for some of my patients do not need to lose weight. Some of my patients don't want to lose weight. And some of my patients actually need to even gain weight. So uh, in, that, in, in those cases, it's really helpful to work with a dietitian uh, to get the macros, to get the carbohydrate and protein and fat ratios uh, in the right range so that people will not, will not lose weight. Those, a lot of the side, the, the weight loss side effects that were seen in children, I mean, again, I'm not a child psychiatrist, but I've studied the epilepsy literature. And, and as you know, the diets that had historically been used to treat a pediatric epilepsy, especially early on, were very restrictive uh, with respect to protein. And so they were extremely high fat diets, about 90% fat, and in many cases, about 6% protein far too little protein. Yeah, just too little protein to, to be healthy, especially for, for, for growth. And so uh, I think some of the side effects that we're seeing uh, in children may be explained by, by that particular relatively uh, extreme version of a ketogenic diet. And that's certainly not the, the type of diet that I use in my practice. So, um, and I, I think there is some confusion in the general public sometimes when people uh, express fears about the ketogenic diet and what might what some of the issues uh, that can come up with it. Sometimes they're looking at that information, which is fair. It's fair to, it's fair to look at that. But I think we, we should be, we should point out to people that they're, they're, the ketogenic diets exist on a spectrum. So there are ketogenic diets that produce very high ketones uh, and are, and in some cases are cal calorically restricted or restricted in protein. And there are then ketogenic diets that are more balanced, so to speak, with respect to protein and fat uh, and are, are designed to be uh, to meet your calorie needs so that you're not losing weight. So these are kind of maybe in the weeds, a little nuances, but I just want people out there who are listening who might not know a lot about ketogenic diets to uh, to know that there are different versions of a ketogenic diet, and that uh, getting the macros right for your personal goals is really a, is really a big part of what will will help you avoid some of those those negative effects. I teach in uh, medical physiology, the GI section, and there's quite a few people who have like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, IBS, and uh, two, two people came up to me after like, it's a, you know, 200 plus students or whatever. And I, I think they actually came across your work because it, it must have been your work because they said, you know, someone from Harvard who was studying this, you or Chris, but really delving into dietary interventions and, um, you know, they were, well, looked to be kind of underweight. But it kind of, it led me, even before I got interested in metabolic psychiatry, uh, I would teach that there's a bi-directional comorbidity associated if you have IBS with psychiatric disorders. And psychiatric disorders can contribute to irritable bowel. And I think you had some issues probably driven by the plant-based diet or maybe, you know, fiber. And I don't do well with fiber, especially in the morning and things. So I kind of like push it towards the end of the day, just a little bit more like a garnish now than, than what I did in the past. Uh, 
but maybe just because I mean, our list, the listeners probably are not familiar with the benefit, the the potential problems that you know high fiber diets, like low fat high fiber diets, can do. So maybe touch on that a little bit, and even from the context of what I think is an important topic here, you know, ulcerative colitis. I, I and there's that's multifactorial. The you know the, the reason for these are multi, and that's important to understand. There's an immune base component and stuff like that too, but maybe discuss a little bit about that and that bi-directional comorbidity, which is something that I teach about. And it just popped into my mind that something I wanted, I wanted to ask you about. Yeah. So that bi-directional comorbidity is really just that it's a vicious cycle, right? So if your metabolic health, if you're, if you're, if you're metabolic health, your immune health, if you've got a lot of inflammation, if you've got a lot of oxidative, what's called oxidative stress, which means too many free radicals uh, being produced by your immune system, uh, your immune system is kind of an overdrive too much inflammation, too much oxidative stress, and insulin resistance, which means that your metabolism isn't going to be, your body's not going to be responding to insulin the way it should. Uh, if you've got all three of those things going on, which many of us do, and these are the three, three of the major driving forces underlying neuropsychiatric illnesses are inflammation, oxidative stress, and insulin resistance, you're going to see problems throughout the body, uh, the brain and in the rest of the body, including in the, the gut is the first line of defense. If you're eating the wrong way, the gut is going to be the first to experience uh, the, the impact of that. And that can be anything from foods that are physically irritating, mechanically irritating to the gut that really are, uh, you know, were never really meant for human consumption, things like grains and, and legumes and certain types of seeds, and, uh, and all the way to uh, uh, you know, foods that are very difficult to digest uh, and, and foods that cause inflammation. And that, and even contains certain toxins. So there are some uh, plant foods uh, that can naturally contain toxins, which which are damaging to our cells. And so the the gut will be the first. That's your first line of defense. Your gut will be the first to experience the uh, effects of a of an unhealthy diet in these various different types of ways, which, whether it's mechanical, whether it's mechanical damage, or whether it's biochemical damage. Um, and so. A lot of my patients who have mental health uh, symptoms, many of them will also have uh, poor gut health as well. Not all of them, but many of them. And so, uh, and this is really what led me to experiment with my diet in the first place was was gut health issues. And I, you know, I thought, well, of all the things that are going on for me, uh, maybe food has something to do with it because sometimes my digestion isn't what it should be, or I have, I'm. I'm I have uncomfortable, I mean, I have stomach pain or what have you. And so, uh, but we don't typically think about the relationship be between food and the brain, but we often think about food in the gut. So it's, it was a natural progression from there. But I think uh, in terms of fiber, it gets a little complicated because, uh, let me try to keep it as simple as possible because I don't want to confuse everybody out there who's listening. It's not, it's not that, I would say that my view is not that um, fiber is bad for people. I wouldn't say that you know, fiber is bad and that nobody should eat it. What I should say is that if you have um, gut health problems, one of the places to look for problems is the amount and type of fiber in your diet. And, and often the recommendation is to increase the amount and type of fiber in your diet. And, what, and there's actually no science to support that whatsoever. Um, there is some, this isn't studied very well, unfortunately, there are a few studies that show us that actually, if you do the opposite, if you reduce the amount of fiber in your diet and you, and you ate a diet that is easier to digest because fiber is by definition indigestible. So it makes sense then stands to reason that if you eat too much fiber, you might actually suffer from indigestion and, and other sorts of gut health problems. So it's very logical when you look, when you stand back and look objectively about what certain foods contain and how our bodies process that food, it all makes perfect sense. But if you go to the standard literature, the standard headlines and the standard guidelines about nutrition, which are not based on science, they're based essentially on guesswork and wishful thinking uh, and ideology about what we should eat, then you become really confused about what you're supposed to do. And what we're usually told is more fiber, not less. And actually what can be much more helpful is less fiber, not more. 
So, uh, and, and again, some people do very well with fiber. So I'm not saying everybody should stop eating it, but keep it in mind as a potential culprit because it's a very common uh, culprit, especially foods that are hard to digest like nuts and grains and legumes and cruciferous vegetables and even uh, certain dairy products. So lots of things we're told are really healthy for us, which can backfire for some of us. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I, I think it's an important thing is it's highly individualistic too. I mean, I grew up eating when I got into fitness and stuff when in high school, a big bowl of oatmeal and, and then Every day in, I always called it a nervous stomach. I was like, you know, in the morning in high school, I always had a nervous stomach and maybe because I was just kind of like a nervous kid or whatever, you know, with school and everything. And I always had like an unsettled stomach in the morning, like always uh, looking back, it really was the fiber eating a big bowl of oatmeal or shredded wheat or whatever, thinking I was eating clean. And, and even today we have, we live on a farm, we have avocado trees, lots of them. If I eat even like a, a whole avocado in the morning, that fiber kind of catches up with me midday and my stomach, I think it's just kind of move through my system fast in the morning. Maybe it's a coffee or whatever, but if I get, uh, I do really well with cruciferous vegetables, at least broccoli. So I can have like a bowl of broccoli even, but I won't have that much. It's more of a small amount or maybe a small salad, some arugula or something, or asparagus or something at the end of the day, or I, I put my fiber in at the end of the day, then I'm fine. I feel like my, my gastric transit time is slowed down and I just, I digest it better over at night. And it does have a more of a satiating. So when in our nutrition course, we're, we're very big about fiber. So still, so because the guidelines and the epidemiological data is so heavily skewed to fiber. You just got to get as much fiber as possible. But, you know, I feel the dose kind of makes the poison and calling fiber a poison here. It's kind of, you know, maybe a little bit hyperbolic or whatever. And from a nutritional science conventional standpoint, but I really share your opinion that things like nuts and too much fiber is the culprit for so many people. And if they dial that back, it's counterintuitive, but I think they're going to feel so much better. So maybe starting with something like a paleo diet, if you have problems and then as sort of the, the barrier to entry, right? It may be hard with a ketogenic diet, but starting with a paleo and then transitioning to more of a, a ketogenic, more of an elimination diet could be the way to go. That's exactly what I recommend in the book that I've written is to start with a paleo diet and then gradually transition to a ketogenic diet if, if necessary. And then even uh, experiment with even a carnivore diet if necessary. So sort of different levels of intervention, depending on your goals and on your personal metabolism and your personal food sensitivities. So it just gives people different choices and it's, it and allows people to kind of personalize their diet to their, to their own needs. And I think there really isn't a one size fits all diet. And this is uh, coming back to your CGM uh, point. One of the ways that I, I like to use CGMs is to help, uh, again, sort of foster curiosity about, about metabolism. I mean, people, people love to know, you know what's going on inside of themselves. It gives you a real window into how your body's working. And you can see, for example, what that bowl of oatmeal is going to do to your blood sugar in the morning. And oatmeal is one of the most, the most uh, uh, I've seen this too many times to count, um, that oatmeal in particular uh, can have a really profound impact on blood sugar, even if it's steel cut oats, which is supposed to be so so good for us. And we we are taught we are taught, but we are here all the time that oatmeal is a brain healthy superfood. This is you know have your bowl of oatmeal, your steel cut oats with the blueberries on top, and that's going to be really set you up for good uh, 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 brain health. And of course, nothing could be further from the truth. And I, I include in the book actually. Um, CGM tracing of uh, someone who's kind enough to share share their data publicly, uh, what the CGM looks like with different types of oatmeal, and and how she actually needed to remove all oatmeal from her diet in order to stabilize her mood. And it was it's these types of kind of curiosity experiments that I think really empower people to uh, take control over their own brain health. Instead of thinking, well, you know, I'm having panic attacks or hypoglycemic episodes, or I'm just feeling unstable out of the blue, uh, rather than thinking that they need medication, they could first, at least, unless they're in a crisis situation, medications can be very useful. Why not start with food first? Why not look there first? Because nine times out of ten, <laughs> you'll be able to, you'll be able to help yourself feel so much better 
Um, and the CGMs are really game changers when it comes to uh, you know, people really being able to see that connection between what they're eating and how they're feeling. Yeah, absolutely. And, and even the same types of foods using a CGM, I find we have avocados and I I've learned to eat them when they're like a bit crunchy. So I will pick them from the tree when they're still slightly green or whatever, and, uh, not avocados, mangoes in this case, mangoes. So, uh, yeah. So with the mango, uh, my wife likes them like kind of almost mushy, like you could eat them with a spoon kind of thing. But, uh, last night I had a, like a huge, we have these massive mangoes and I cut it and I ate, almost ate it like a crunchy apple and my CGM, I looked at the levels app and my CGM was like nearly flat. But the night before I had one that had fallen on the ground. It was kind of like a dessert really, but the sugar spike was completely, totally, it looked like I ate two different kinds of foods and I actually enjoyed the crunchiness of the semi ripe, you know, mango over. So yeah, there's insights like this that you would never, ever understand or acknowledge the, the oatmeal thing too, is something that you mentioned that I also observed probably one of my biggest spikes ever came from a bowl of, you know, Quaker oats, no, you know, just a sprinkle of, of cinnamon on top too. And it's just, it spiked me really high. So it was almost like drinking Coke. Um, yeah, it was really eye opening. Yeah, isn't that something? And, and the things you can discover, I mean, I find it so endlessly fascinating. Like you said, same food can cause different types of reactions depending on its state. So whether it's whether it's uh, unripe or ripe, whether it's cooked or raw, I mean, that's another uh, big difference. And of course, when it comes to grains, particle size, whether it's highly refined or whether it's kind of just chopped into pieces. Uh, the degree of refinement can make a big difference too. So yeah, I think that's fascinating what you discovered. In addition to the CGM and looking at glycemic variability, uh, are there other, I know your outcome measures are, you know, how people feel, right? Like, are you feeling better? You know, that's like the important outcome measure, but do you have people do blood work where you're looking at insulin and have you seen a correlation of improvement, not only in glycemic variability, but also uh, reducing insulin resistance uh, by definition, you no know, uh, lowered fasting insulin. Oh, of course. I mean, fasting insulin is uh, one of the one of the one of the one of the most helpful uh, laboratory tests a person can order. Uh, psychiatrist or any other type of, type of medical professional can order that really gives you, I mean, along with the lipid profile. I think that's another very very useful one. The triglycerides HDL, um, with paying a lot less attention to LDL, of course. So. Uh, th those, uh, getting a fasting insulin, that's something I've been doing for years. And I used to do it even with my college students, uh, at Smith college where I worked for five years after I left Harvard, I would routinely see, I mean, for people out there who might not be familiar with, with standard insulin measurements, at least in the U S the normal, uh, what you really want to see ideally is you want to see a fasting insulin of say six or below. I mean, I always say to people at least make, we'd like to see your fasting insulin in single digits. And six or below is 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 is, is really ideal. Uh, but I would routinely see in young women, uh, you know, these are 18, 19, 20 year old people, insulins in the 20s and 30s fasting insulin routinely. And of course, if you lower your carbohydrate intake, because carbohydrate is the macronutrient that spikes insulin the most, has the biggest effect on insulin. It's not that it's the only thing that affects insulin, but it affects insulin the most. If you lower your carbohydrate intake, that will drop your insulin. And that's, uh, it's really effective and really predictable uh, response. And it, it can change in just a matter of weeks. And the same with triglycerides. So uh, 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 triglycerides, which are part of the standard uh, cholesterol panel, um, they are really, they, they almost always drop like a stone on a low carbohydrate diet. You can see people's triglycerides drop by hundreds of points in just a few weeks by reducing, by, by getting their carbohydrate intake under control and spent a ketogenic diet very, very reliably, not in every single case, but in nearly every single case will drop those triglycerides. And that's a really healthy, that's really, really good news for you, for your cardiovascular health. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there are super important biomarkers and another one that we measure in our, uh, research and I've been measuring for quite some time with a home kit, actually a cardio metabolic home kit is a high sensitivity C-reactive protein. We know that systemic inflammation uh, can contribute to neuroinflammation. So if you have inflammation systemically, that is undoubtedly, you know, affecting the blood brain barrier uh, and in ways and your gut permeability too. those same tight junctions are at your in your gut or in your blood brain barrier. 
So, and that's highly impacted by uh, it, your inflammation status. I remember getting a little gut bug, uh, you know, when I was traveling and then doing a cardiometabolic kit, my HSCRP was off the charts, where it's usually 0.1 or non detectable. Uh, just, you know, so gut health is like so important for your immune function and inflammatory state. And if that HS, if that CRP is popping up, that's undoubtedly affecting your brain. So I was wondering, you know, is that something that you're measuring inflammatory markers too? Because we just think it's so important. Yes. I, I always measure, measure an HSCRP or a CRP, depending on what, what we can get. And um, at least according to the literature, when I last reviewed it for the training program, it seemed that you could also use a CRP if you needed to, and it would be almost as good. Uh, the because this gives you a, inflammation is one of as we were talking about before it's one of the key driving forces behind neuropsychiatric illness and just illness in general. Uh, you don't want too much inflammation in the body. You do you do need inflammation. Inflammation is good and healthy part of the immune system. You need you need inflammation, but you don't want too much of it. You don't want too much of a good thing. So um, and so that CRP will give you. Um, uh, one window into your inf in inflammatory status. And so I, I always measure that. And there's some literature also to suggest that people with depression, particularly with uh, depression with psychotic features, uh, they are more likely to have an elevated uh, CRP. And this makes sense when you think about it. And th th they're also, they're also uh, less likely to respond to antidepressants. And this makes sense too when you think about it, because if their depression is being driven by inflammation, as opposed to being driven by a neurotransmitter imbalance, uh, then you then, a, then a, a medication that is targeting neurotransmitters is not going to be particularly helpful. Yeah, it's super helpful. Well, I know we're moving quickly and I, uh, I want to make sure that we cover the research that you did and published. So I'm jumping now to your Twitter feed where you have a post that's pinned there and it has almost 1000 retweets. Wow. I didn't notice that before. Uh, so, and your post is our new study finding that the ketogenic diet is safe, feasible, and associated with unprecedented psychiatric and metabolic benefits has just been published in open access frontier psychiatry. Uh, so the question you posed, can eating a ketogenic diet improve symptoms of serious mental illness? And this included 31 patients, uh, bipolar, there was 12 of them, major depression, schizophrenia. Uh, you describe a ketogenic diet, 75 to 80% fat, 15 to 20% protein, 5% carbohydrates. Symptoms improved in 100% of patients, 43% achieved clinical remission, 96% of patients lost weight. And 64% uh, of patients were discharged on less medication. Uh, so that's just a summary, not to like scoop your <laughs> discussion of that, but can you give a little bit of, of insight into those findings and these profound findings, which should the world of, you know, psychiatry should really be taking notice of these results and, uh, and, and just a first step, you know, obviously an observational uh, study with, with no control group. And they were kind of, yeah, but maybe describe some of the nuances with the study. Well, I actually appreciate you summarizing it. Uh, that takes a lot, <laughs> it makes it easier for me. Uh, yeah, it's, um, this, this was the work of my colleague and friend, Dr. Albert Denal. He's a psychiatrist, uh, practicing in Toulouse, France. He's been practicing psychiatry there for more than 35 years. And he, uh, his, the patients that he works with are primarily of North African and French descent uh, with serious chronic mental illnesses. And he's been working with some of these patients for decades. And uh, what I found, I mean, so many remarkable things I find about his, his work. Uh, the reason why he decided to ask 31 of his, of his patients who had treat, what are, what's called treatment resistant mental illness, uh, uh, the reason why he asked them to come into the hospital and try a ketogenic diet is because they were not responding to uh, all of the different types of ways that he had tried to help them uh, with, with medications uh, and psychotherapy and, and support and even repeated hospitalizations, and in some cases, even electroconvulsive therapy or ECT in the past. So uh, he had witnessed a young family member of his and his extended family uh, with epilepsy and autism respond beautifully to a ketogenic diet within just a few weeks of having started it. And when he saw that, this was a number of years ago, he thought to himself, 
I wonder if this diet, this diet seems to be good for the brain. I wonder if this diet could help my patients. I, I, I have nothing left to offer them except my ongoing support. <laughs> uh, and so th these, these folks who trusted him, they came into the hospital and uh, they stayed in some cases for very long periods of time. In any case, he put them on a ketogenic diet in the hospital setting. This has never been done before in any kind of a, you know, sort of organized or systematic way. And, uh, and all of them improved. Uh, there were three people who weren't able to stick with the diet for more than a couple of weeks. And so uh, we, didn't, we didn't analyze that information because they didn't stay on it long enough. But 28 out of 31 did stay on the diet and everyone, everyone improved. And I want to just reiterate what you said, 43% of these patients achieved clinical remission. That is that you do not see that with conventional psychiatric care, and especially without increasing medications. And the other thing uh, that I want to say about this is that um, uh, these were patients, we didn't have a control group. And we, it, it's, it's really been really important to point that out that this, it, it, he didn't take half of the patients and, and give them a different diet. He didn't take half of the patients and tell them not to change their diet. He put all of the patients on the same diet. And the reason he did that was because he's not a researcher. He's a clinician. He was simply trying to help his patients and seeing what would happen. And we published, this is what it's called a retrospective study. We published the, in, the outcomes after the fact because they were so noteworthy. And we just thought they deserved to be shared. And so that hopefully will help people, inspire people to do more rigorous research, which I think it has done. And so the, the, the other piece of, even though we didn't have a control group, what's really interesting about this particular group of people, because he's been working with them for so long, um, they, all of these patients had been hospitalized one or even multiple times, either at this same hospital where the study was conducted or at a similar sister facility, which is in the same county or equivalent in France, without this kind of uh, this kind of response. So, really, the only difference between this hospitalization and their previous hospitalizations was the ketogenic diet. So, we can't, of course, say with any certainty that the ketogenic diet was responsible for these really remarkable um, outcomes. But it would be hard to explain it otherwise, because we really do think it had a lot to do with it. But of course, we need to. We need to be careful in uh, interpreting these results, and, and uh, there are wonderful scientists like 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 Dr. Ian Campbell and Dr. Shabani Sethi and and other scientists around the world who are now testing these theories more rigorously. So I think it's it's really a huge victory for uh, ketogenic diets for mental health that Dr. Danan did this work with his patients to show the rest of the world what might be possible if you try if you try something different it's really simple dietary intervention that he used yeah is uh well in the figure here was there uh an equal amount of males and females a follow up question is that uh have you had any problems with women that are and someone asked me to ask you this someone I talked to yesterday with perimenopause or menopause is the transition into a ketogenic diet different because in that subset of females, some of them have more psychiatric uh, conditions or the onset of that. But yeah, males versus females in this trial, and then any experience uh, with women uh, postmenopause or perimenopause. Uh, okay. 71% female. And so it was, uh, yep. So the mean age was 50 years old. The range was 27 to 73 years old and 71% were female. Mm-hmm. And so I can answer your question about uh, uh, perimenopause and menopause from two perspectives, well, three perspectives. Uh, one perspective is, uh, you know, in this particular study, we had you know, lots of middle-aged and older women and they transitioned to the diet just as easily as everybody else did. Uh, the second is from a, as a, from a clinician perspective, um, I have many middle-aged and older women, uh, perimenopausal and postmenopausal women that I've worked with and I can, I can I'd be happy to talk with you about some of the challenges there with ketogenic diets in that particular stage of life. Uh, it, it's just as easy to adopt a ketogenic diet, and it's just as easy to transition to the diet. It's less easy to benefit as much from a ketogenic diet. You have to be stricter. You have to do certain other things to improve your metabolic health than simply just dropping your carbohydrate intake. If you are perimenopausal or postmenopausal, you'll face additional metabolic and hormonal challenges. Happy to go into that. And then 
my personal perspective as a woman who uh, is uh, about to turn 59 years old, um, I you know went through uh, my perimenopausal years on a ketogenic diet, needed to make a number of changes to it in order to continue to be- get the same benefits. I had to make some adjustments to it because your metabolism changes. <laughs> your metabolism changes when you go through menopause in ways that in some ways in which we understand and in some ways which are very poorly studied. And so lots we could talk about there, but I just want to say to women who are out there who are in your 40s and 50s, do not shy away from a ketogenic diet. In fact, it will be your best friend if you're going through menopause and having uh, some of the the physical, uh, emotional, and other t- types of changes that that you're experiencing that are that are uh, making you unhappy <laughs> with your with your body and and your emotional and cognitive health, a ketogenic diet's really well worth considering. Um, you just may need to work a little harder at it than uh, than than younger people do. Yeah, great advice. Uh, yeah, I had several women send me blood work and their T three levels were lower, but they felt great. I mean, they were getting great metabolic benefits and things like that, and. Maybe the T3 was lower just because they might be exercising more or they're in a caloric deficit. But I've seen that as a feature uh, in females just from the volume of emails that I've gotten over the last decade. <laughs> uh, that, 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 That's you interesting. Know, and it's not like, you know, it, it dro- in some cases it's below normal, but it just, there's a reduction in T3 and sometimes within the normal range, sometimes below normal. But in the below normal cases, they're usually caloric restricted or they're usually over exercising, in my opinion. So just an observation. And, and T3 is complicated. It's very interesting what you're pointing out, but T3 is also a little bit complicated because we can't measure receptor activity and we can't measure, you know, so it's, it's, it's a little bit of a black box. Um, and so I usually, a lot of my patients who consult with me nowadays, because now I have a specialty practice where it's all nutrition based and, 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 and a lot of the people who come to me are already quite savvy about nutrition and they've already had lots and lots of tests, sometimes, you know, pages and pages of, of, of tests. And, and they're really sometimes very focused on lots of these different numbers. And they're worried about you know, their MTHFR and they're worried about their T3 and they're worried about, you know, um, uh, every number that they can get their hands on, uh, genetics and microbiome testing, all kinds of other things. And I really, when I'm first working with somebody, I really try to help simplify all of that by saying, let's focus on the basics first. Let's let's get the diet where it needs to be, fundamentals first, and then we can look into the into the more complicated labs if you're not feeling better. Because if your T3 is low but you're feeling well, I'm not sure if I care about that. Um, if your T3 is low and you're not feeling well, your energy is low, you're depressed, etc., then we may need to we need to take that more seriously. But I really try very hard, despite my own uh, interest in getting into the weeds and getting to the bottom of things, I really try very hard to treat the patient, not the levels, whenever possible. And this is true even in terms of ketone levels. So not all my patients need high ketone levels. Not all my patients even need ketone levels above 1 or 1.5, although many do, some don't. And if their ketones are 0.7 and they're feeling great, I think that's great. Um, I, it's really about, you know, you know how they're doing at the end of the day, but I, I will confess that I don't fully understand, um, everything about, uh, what you're, what you're noticing, observing with T3 levels. I find it interesting. I wish I uh, could explain it more, but, uh, there's so much more we, <laughs> so much more we can, can learn. Yeah. It's more sensitive to like energy balance too. Like if you're in a caloric death and you're losing weight and other things are improving, and then I think, I think this is true with males too, with like hormone levels. If testosterone is low, some guys are like, I feel great. I mean, I think their androgen receptor density on the membranes might be higher, right? You know, training, lifestyle, these things can improve receptor function and, you know, things like that. Yeah. Maybe their hormones are, beco- are working better. They're becoming more efficient. And so you need less of them. Uh, the, and that, that could be part of it too. So I agree with you. Um, I, I think that's, that's really wise to think of it that way. Can you share, uh, Georgia and elaborate on your ketogenic diet clinical training program, because getting what you're talking about here, getting this information out and training practitioners is like probably the most important thing, right? So the benefits of the clinical training program, the continuing educational, uh, credits, that people can get from it. Can you uh, describe the framework for that and and how 
uh, you're working with on the education front? Yeah. So I, a number of years ago, you know, when I was first um, speaking publicly about this and people were, uh, and, and uh, when I, when I shifted from my college mental health, I, I was specialized in college mental health for many years at Harvard and at Smith. When I decided to leave Smith and, and focus exclusively on, on nutritional and metabolic psychiatry, um, a lot of people were interested in, in, in coming for help far more people, of course, than I could see myself. And, uh, and this was true for my colleagues as well. The handful of us who, who were doing this at the time and we're off practices filled up very quickly and we had long wait lists. And I thought, well, there's a huge demand for these services and, and all these people really want to do this and I want to help them all, but I, I can't, and, and I can't refer them to anybody else. So that was the, that was why I decided to create this training program was because I thought, well, we need more people who know how to do this. And so we need better access to, to metabolic care for psychiatric um, conditions. And so in 2020, I, I developed this program and it's approved for CMEs as well for lots of different types of medical professionals, including nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, MDs. Uh, and uh, it's also approved for nutrition professionals through the ANA. So there are, I can't remember exactly, I think it's seven, seven credits for MDs and it might be a little bit more for nutrition professionals. But in any case, uh, there, I now run it two different ways. It, it had previously been exclusively live in small groups, at virtual, you know, six clinicians per, per training, uh, 90 minutes, uh, every week for five weeks, uh, and includes lots and lots of supplemental materials to support people in their practice and, uh, lots of scientific references and all kinds of resources. But in any case, uh, it was, it was previously just live and I'm running four live classes in August. I think there are two or three spots left in those classes. And then I'm running more classes in September. I usually run almost every month, three or four groups. And then, but also because so many people weren't able to, to work out the scheduling or uh, they're because of time zone differences, or they just didn't, there's, they just uh, prefer to learn on their own. You can, you know, there is now a way to take the course offline, so to speak, uh, at a reduced cost where you, I can just send you the, the uh, video recordings and the supplemental materials, and you can work on the program yourself. That's not approved for education credits, but it is less expensive and it's uh, more convenient for some people. So two different ways, two different ways to do it now. Hey, Georgia, maybe you can explain to our listeners uh, three things that they could do uh, in regard to uh, implementing the ketogenic diet. So three first steps they would do in transitioning to the basically the therapy that you're talking about, which is nutritional ketosis? Sure. So that's a great question. So the first thing uh, everyone can do, and you don't need any professional support to do this, uh, is take as much as possible uh, the ultra-processed foods, junk foods, and non-foods out of your diet starting right now. Uh, eliminate them to the extent that you can, meaning all of the snack foods and packaged foods and prepared foods, anything that isn't a whole plant or animal food. Uh, if you transition to a paleo diet first, that is safe for everyone, for women, for pregnant women, for children, for elderly, you, it, whether you're taking medications or whether you have any kind of health issues, doesn't matter. A paleo diet is safe and easy to do. And uh, I will always recommend that as a first step. Uh, even if you are ultimately going to eventually transition to a ketogenic diet, if you start with paleo first, it will make the ketogenic diet transition period later more uh, smooth, smooth and more comfortable and less of a shock to your system because it's already taking out a lot of the refined carbohydrate and uh, lowering your blood sugar and insulin levels to a certain extent. So that's step one. Step two is uh, to get some very simple uh, blood tests and other measures uh, evaluate yourself for insulin resistance. And there's a, a few really simple ones you can do. Some of these you probably have already had done, or you can do simply uh, for yourself at home. So one is you can measure your waist circumference and compare it to your height. And if your waist circumference is more than twice your height, then that's a clue that you probably have insulin resistance. But also uh, uh, you have probably already had a fasting uh, what's called a fasting lipid panel or cholesterol panel test. And if you look at that test and you look at your triglycerides and you, you take your triglycerides and you divide it by your HDL, that number um, should be less than two. So if your triglycerides are more than twice your HDL, that's another sign that you probably have insulin resistance. Um, 
Uh, and then the other thing is ask your uh, doctor or order it for yourself online. It's not expensive. It's, you know, $15, $20. Get a fasting insulin level. That's another really excellent test uh, for insulin resistance. If your fasting insulin level is in the double digits, then that's, uh, that's not a good sign. You really want to lower that by reducing the amount of carbohydrate in your diet. Even if you don't want to eat a ketogenic diet, lowering your overall carbohydrate intake to say, 90 grams a day, say 30 grams per meal, is perfectly safe uh, for most people. Uh, again, wouldn't require a lot of professional assistance unless you have uh, serious medical conditions. And so I would say that so the first thing is cleaning up your diet, uh, transitioning to paleo diet, I would recommend, getting some blood tests and doing some measurements at home. And the third thing uh, is then to make an appointment with your healthcare practitioner to discuss whether or not a ketogenic diet, say that you're interested in a ketogenic diet and have that discussion with your psychiatrist, your psychologist, your, your uh, primary care doctor, your nurse practitioner to start to get the wheels rolling in terms of, you know, what would it take for you to transition to this diet safely? And if you can't find somebody, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if the practitioners you're working with don't know a lot about ketogenic diets or they don't feel comfortable learning about them or don't want to help you with it because they don't have the time or the interest or the knowledge. Um, on my website, there is, uh, if you click on uh, the website's diagnosis diet, there's a tab called directory. And there's a, there's a free uh, searchable database, a clinician directory, specifically uh, to help you find practitioners of various kinds who use ketogenic diets uh, in their clinical work to help people specifically with mental health conditions. And so this is an international searchable database. It's free to search. Uh, and you can look for somebody who might be able to partner with your local clinicians or perhaps even somebody in your area that you might be able to work with directly if you don't have uh, don't already have somebody to work with. So those would be my three my three recommended steps. That is great advice. I've been to the directory too, and that's a, an amazing resource. Thank you for compiling that and sharing that. Sure, sure. I've shared it to quite a few people already. Uh, in addition, I mean, you have a forthcoming, you have a book coming out and maybe describe sort of what went into that book and, and how, if that will be a framework. I mean, many things that you're talking about today go into very high detail within the book, the rationale for it, the science behind it. And also most importantly, the, the art and the nuances of, of, of implementing this right? These approaches is going to be in your book. So people listening really uh, pre-order the book. I, I don't know. I forget when it's coming out, but maybe share with our listeners, you know, what's the essence of it and when it's coming out. Yeah, no, th thanks for, thanks for giving the opportunity to talk about it because um, uh, it's not out yet. It, you can pre-order it now. It's called Change Your Diet, Change Your Mind, and it will be coming out on January 23rd. So, but it, you can pre-order it now if, if that's if that makes you happy. <laughs> but the but the uh, really the goal of this book is to is to show people not just the science but also the science behind these nutritional uh, strategies, which are paleo diets, ketogenic diets, carnivore diets, and elimination diets, and uh, but not just the science behind it, but also how to. And so it's really to show people how much more control they have over their mood, their energy, their concentration, their productivity then they realize, because most of us have been feeding our brain improperly for our entire lives. And so you really have no idea how much better you can feel and function if you eat properly, no matter how old you are. I was just sharing before we started rolling that my mom was 89, uh, just readopted a ketogenic diet after years of being off of it in January. And her health has improved remarkably. Um, she's 89 years old and she's still able to, to reap multiple physical and mental health benefits from this diet. So it's never too late. And, uh, what I designed this diet to do was to really redefine or maybe define for the first time what a brain healthy diet is. We talk all the time, what's a heart healthy diet? What's a healthy diet for weight loss? But really what is a brain healthy diet? And so I, I think it's quite simple. I think it needs to nourish the brain. It by providing all essential nutrients. It needs to protect the brain from damage, from oxidative stress, excessive oxidative stress, excessive inflammation, and insulin resistance. And it needs to energize the brain in ways that safely uh, promote a healthy brain metabolism over the lifespan, which means protecting your brain's ability to produce energy for your entire life. 
And, and that just means keeping blood sugar and insulin levels in good control. And so, and I show people exactly how to do this, why to do this. And there's lots of information in the book about why the nutrition science that we're told about is wrong. And then there's lots of information in the book about everybody's favorite foods and food groups and, you know, sort of the pluses and minuses of eating certain types of foods and, and debunk some of the myths behind certain brain superfoods like red wine and dark chocolate and flax seeds and all of those things, which are, which are really just not going to be helpful to you at all. And in some cases, quite, uh, quite the opposite. Uh, and so just lots of information about food, information about how the brain, brain metabolism works and then how to put that information to use for yourself. There's the whole fourth part of the book, the whole the final section is uh, diets and meal plans and recipes put together by Patricia Daly. She's a nutrition therapist based in Ireland um, who has used ketogenic diets for years uh, to put her own cancer in remission and help other people um, with cancer and other metabolic conditions improve their health. So I hope what people will find in this book is that um, that I really, what I'm trying to do is in, in the same way as the training program, really just educate and empower people to take their mental health into their own hands. And because uh, right now we've got a lot of really exciting information, but not enough actionable information. And especially if you're taking psychiatric medications, or if you have, uh, if you're taking any medication at all, prescription medication at all, or if you have any kind of a significant health issue, heart disease, uh, diabetes, um, uh, high blood pressure, there, there, you have to be very careful. Uh, you have to really know what you're doing when you start a ketogenic diet, which was one of the reasons why I created the training program in the first place is you really do need to understand that this is a powerful metabolic intervention that is going to change your blood sugar levels, change your insulin levels, change your medication levels in some cases, uh, and change your fluid and electrolyte balance very quickly often within 24 hours. So if you do not know how to navigate that transitional period safely, you could really uh, be in trouble. And so it's not that the diet is dangerous. It's that um, the combination of this diet with certain medications of certain health conditions, especially if you adopt it too quickly and without proper preparation, um, can be dangerous. The diet, it's the changes that are coming from this diet are very healthy. Real, you want lower insulin levels. You want lower blood sugar levels. You want lower blood pressure levels, but but you need to just navigate that safely. And so, um, one of the reasons I wrote the book was to help explain, okay, why it is that some people look at this diet as dangerous, and why some people look at this diet as life changing and 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 positive and amazing. The devil is really in the details, and so putting that information in the book so that people understand why you hear these two very different things about this really important dietary intervention. Those details are so important. And I thank you so much. This, this information is gold. And you are really, Georgia, you are a gift to the metabolic psychiatry community. Thank you for the work that you're doing and for sharing this information on a whole new level podcast. It's like the abstract version <laughs> uh, information. It's like the cliff notes of what you'll find in, well, on your educational training course and in your book, which really gets into the details and, uh, and how to the, all the nuances on implementing this, which is really important for people not to just jump into this, but to educate themselves on the details that you put in the book and in training program. So thank you so much, Georgia, for sharing this information. Uh, how can people connect with you? How can they, I know you have an active Twitter account and things, but maybe share with people before we go uh, the best way to connect with you. Yeah. So first, thanks for those really nice words. It means a lot to me. I really hope that this information helps people. That's what it's all about. And I apologize that I have been virtually silent on Twitter for the past couple of months because I've been traveling so much and writing so much and getting the book done. But I I will be back on Twitter within the next week, I believe. Uh, but uh, Twitter is where I spend most of my social media energy, but I'm also on Facebook and I'm on LinkedIn as well. But Twitter is at Georgia Ede MD. So my last name is spelled E-D-E. And then uh, also my website, which is diagnosisdiet.com. Uh, lots of free information and resources there as well. Um, there'll be a conference coming up in November in Boston of people are metabolic psychiatry conference in Boston, the first weekend in November. Uh, I hope that if you're in the Northeast, you'll come and join us there. Uh, that will be a, a, a great event. 
So I, I, I really want to thank you, uh, Don, for inviting me to, to speak with your listeners and hope that, hope that this information helps people.